my trips to, to France. Well, of course, the Congress has a beloved wife died in September of 1782 after only 10 years, 9 months, and 6 days of marriage. And I was bereft for at least a year. I could hardly believe the fact that she died, I was holding her hands with her. I fell on the floor and I just fainted and my poor daughter was more than 11. And she thought I was going to die too, we were in orphan. So after about three days, I came out of that. And it took me about three weeks of just riding my horse on my plantation. To overcome the grief, the intense grief of losing my helpmate. So when the Congress said to me, we think you should go to France in 1784, to relieve Dr. Franklin, and I thought, yes, I was fluent in French, I would do that. So I took a ship over, and I took Martha, who's then my eldest, and I left behind three daughters. Well, while I was in Paris for five years, two of those daughters died uh, before the age of two. That all children died. 20% of all children died before the age of five, because we didn't have the salt and drugs and the penicillins and the things that you could take for granted that we knew nothing about. And to lose a wife and child, and my wife died of childbirth complications because she had delivered me six babies. Well, four of those babies died. And so I had two daughters. Eventually, uh, uh, Martha came over with me. I put her into a convent school, and I was an ambassador to France. Well, France was such a revelation to me. They had an ancient culture. Now it was, you know, 90% of the population was poor as field mice, and 10% lorded over them in, a, in an aristocracy that I thought was really quite inane. Uh, you know, there's a natural aristoi of virtue and talent, and an artificial aristoi is based on wealth and birth. And I didn't want any of that in my country. So we all made sure that the president was not called your excellency. No, he is simply the president, sir, if you will. What greater honorific for any man to be called sir. So, while I was there, <laughs> Martha came to me one day, she was about 13, I guess. She said, Father, I love it here in the convent. I'm going to become a nun. And they yanked her into the way out. <laughs> or someplace else. Uh, now, eventually, I missed my youngest daughter, especially when the very youngest, Lucy Elizabeth, died. Um, I said to my sister, who was at Monticello watching the babies, I said, please send Maria, we called her Polly, she was, uh, I think, nine. Please send her over. No, seven, seven. So, at any rate, uh, I said, send a slave with her so that she will be protected. Now, unbeknownst to me, my sister sent a 14-year-old girl named Sally Hemings, who was part of the Hemings clan that my wife had inherited when her father died, John Wade. And as a consequence, she came into my life and became uh, my concubine. At the age of 15, born her first child at 16. That child died. She went on, when we went back to America, she said, she found out, because I didn't tell her when we get into slavery, but I didn't tell her that the minute she and her brother had landed in, a, in France, they were free. Because France had barred, done away with slavery in 1789. Well, eventually the brother was put into a French cooking school, and he found out that he was actually free, told his sister, and she said to me, Master, I will not go back to America with you unless you agree to free our children. So I agree. And eventually, she bore me seven babies, five of whom survived into adulthood, or totally seven. And two were light enough to be considered white, and therefore could pass. I allowed them to escape, gave them money, but lost to history, so they could never acknowledge they had a slave mother. The other three were dark enough to remain African-American, and from them, you may now charge the part of my family that came down through them. Now, you haven't asked, but slavery was evil. It was a pernicious evil. 
I wrote a tremble for my country when I remember that God is just. I also quoted Homer, who said, Whenever a man makes a slave, that day takes half his worth away. Now, we didn't understand that slavery was legal, it was moral, it was always been. But this was the first time in Europe that black people were slaves. Always before, in Europe, uh, in Greece or in Rome, they've been white, but they could buy their freedom. In our country, that was frowned upon. In Virginia, you may not teach a slave to read or write because they didn't want them to know, although I advocated educating every boy up to the age of 18, every, or up to the age of 21, every girl up to the age of 18. I thought that was right, whether it be black or white, but that was never implemented in my life. I tried four different times to ban slavery, even though I was a slaveholder, to ban it from this country because I knew that it was morally wrong. But because it was a peculiar institution for the South, because we used slaves to, for economic benefits and degraded them as a result, I simply couldn't get enough support. I put it into the Declaration of Independence. It was taken out. Uh, in fact, the states of South Carolina and Georgia came to uh, Mr. Adams and Mr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin, who was shepherding, and said, we will not become a part of the United States of America if you do not recognize our peculiar institution. So they came to me and said, you must take it out. You, you cannot keep it. So I took it out. I put it into the Articles of Confederation. Couldn't get a second. I put it into the uh, Bill of Rights. Did not pass. The timing was not right. Now, that was a wrong, a moral wrong, a stain on this country and on my honor. But it was then. Today, you have no slavery. Now, there's economic slavery. That's a whole other issue. But physical slavery does not exist in this country. And I presume there's a very good reason for it, because you're all whole. Because the notion that one set of people had a right to dictate to the other actually supported my worst feelings about democracy, which I thoroughly believed in. And I said that any system that allows 51% of the population to dictate to the other 49% of the population cannot survive. For any law to be passed, Sure, the majority rule stands. But for any rule, it has to be reasonable or it cannot stand. That the rights of the minority must be protected by the majority. So we ended up saying with your um, 15, 13, 14, and 15 amendments that slavery was gone forever. And I have anticipated this great civil war that took place well, when this building was built. The Great Civil War that was so awful, where 675,000 men died or remained. It was an awful war. I anticipated it in 1820, when the Missouri Compromise kept the Senate at 20 from the South and 20 from the North, and the Maine came in as a uh, free state, and Missouri came in as a slave state. And then the great battles here in California about miners, for instance, coming from the South and bringing in 1849, bringing their slaves with them to work the mines. A lot of men who were working on the same mines said, you will do no such thing. Either you work it yourself or you get the hell out. And that's what happened. Slavery was never a part of California. Oh, these were very long. A black woman named Biddy Mason in Los Angeles successfully fought to keep, to keep away from her slave owner who had brought her here because she said, I'm not in a slave country right now. And she was. But it was a very long haul, bloody civil war. And what you must never allow is your government to be so wrong on such an issue to, to, to deny any citizen its full rights. How many of you as women voted in the last election? Good, look at that. Okay, until 1920, that was not a lot. Actually, in New Jersey, women could vote in local elections, and that was taken away in 1807. And I myself said women should not be a part of the political system. It's too degrading. Men are too boisterous, too rude. And uh, your husbands will tell you what to do. <laughs> John, John Adams 
when we were in Congress, uh, Abigail wrote him a letter and said, as long as you're handing out rights to men, please remember the ladies. And he wrote back and said, Madam, it is well known that the wife is the natural tyrant of the household and therefore has no need of the vote. <laughs> I don't think you can get away with that today. I actually thought women shouldn't dance after they got married because, God forbid, they might actually dance with a man who wasn't their husband. 